public comment? Doesn't look like it. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of May 6th? I move to approve the minutes of May 6th. Second. Discussion? Yeah, can I just say that um, I, uh, I don't really think we need to have four page printouts of each slide. You can probably just take a four page or something like that. Um, especially when we get those long presentations. It's, I think it's a waste of paper, to be honest. Um, but that's all. <laughs> it was a good presentation. But uh, electronic, you know, if someone who really wants it will get the electronic copy. In. But we have to have a have it preserved, but maybe, you know, four per page or something like that. Is that, is that doable? Is there any discussion on the notes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll have a report from dispatch, Ms. Woods. Aye, Hello. how are you? Good. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I don't have very much for a presentation, but just to kind of to give you an idea of where dispatch has been. Um, we had the consolidation meetings with East Hampton Public Safety, and, and it made it all the way to the feasibility study, and we we're going to move into the implementation phase, but part of the feasibility study was that the consultants recommended that we have the center here in Northampton just for expandability um, and looking down the road about increased call volume, increased staffing. The site that East Hampton wanted was their public safety dispatch center, which did not accommodate for any of that room. Um, so they pulled out of the study, so now that pretty much has gone by the wayside. Yeah. East Hampton pulled out because they, they couldn't have it at home? They didn't give the reasons as to why, but um, once they found that out, they just didn't seem interested at all. And they didn't see the cost-saving measure that the mayor wanted to see, but ultimately it was the mayor said that it was up to the chiefs. So. I thought I saw something. That was another issue that they couldn't prove that we were going to have the funding 10 years from now. But I mean, how do you predict that anyway? It was, it was more like you've got to be a self-sustaining department. So there are a number of factors, but I know that that played a big portion because they started off saying that they want to have it in their center. If, they, if it's not going to be there, then it's not worth it to them because they lose the desk officer and the, the walk-in traffic, which is what the dispatcher provides over there. Um, and also that they lose the capabilities of having the um, tie into the state computer system with CGIS and LEAPS. So they weren't going to ha have the ability to run plates through their dispatch center if they came here. Because that's something that we don't do in Northampton. It has to be under law enforcement guidance, and there's all these rules for that. Um, so that was another thing that had added to the reason for pulling out of the study, I believe. Um, our staffing levels are not an issue at this time, which is good. We've been full staffing. Our the dispatcher came back today. It was her first day back from maternity leave. But we are seeing a really big increase in call volume, um, and it seems to be like the seriousness of calls. It seems like we're getting some pretty significant calls lately. Um, just increased violence or concern for public safety. So it's good that we're up to full staffing. Um, but if we continue down this path, we should see a decrease in our overtime budget um, and an increase in the availability to train. Um, with one month remaining to the fiscal year, I've used the majority of my fire alarm monitoring funds. If you remember, we uh, monitor fire alarms for a number of businesses in the city and the burglar fire alarms for municipal buildings, which was a cost-saving measure to the city, but it was also a revenue source previously for the fire department, and we just took that over this past year and we'll continue to, moving forward, we'll be getting those funds direct. The intent of that is to put it back into the dispatch center's um, budget for capital improvement projects that we wouldn't normally get approval for, um, and just to have that extra revenue source. Um, I believe that they are moving in to put a cap on that as far as I want to say was the proposed cap was $40,000. So anything above $40,000 will go back to the general fund. But we revenue about $32,000 a year from that, um, from that alone. Um, so this past year we have a radio maintenance contract that dispatch absorbed that part for the budget for um, police, fire, and the dispatch center and then the DPW pays their own portion separately. So that came out of my fire alarm monitoring funds this past year. So it was about twenty-two thousand um, dollars. And then we moved when we had put in the new system for our fire alarm monitoring. We originally was going through phone lines, but now it goes through radio boxes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that at all. 
Um, but part of our plan was to build in a redundancy system. So if there's a failure, like one of the towers gets knocked out in our receiving center or a piece of equipment gets knocked out, we can switch it over to a backup. We completed that project in the last two weeks. So I paid that out of my, my fire alarm monitoring fund as well. But that was kind of a plan that's been going for about three years now. So I've finally been able to complete that. Um, I'm projecting. Is that, for, is that for all monitoring or is it just the fire alarms? It's for our, well, our fire alarm in the city building. Okay. for police, um, sorry, burglary and fire. Okay. Basically, like say this building, the burglar alarm is activated, it'll go to the next strongest radio box signal and then it bumps it back to the fire station. Um, it's actually a pretty interesting system how it works out. So there isn't actual monitoring for it. There's no off-site, it, it's all based on what the readings are. Yep, it comes right to our dispatch center. So if we were to trip an alarm here, it goes directly to dispatch. Right, so you have to have somebody come and trip the alarm. No, no, I mean, like, if somebody comes in and is trying to break in the building here, it'll, it'll activate the alarm and it'll come right to our dispatch. Oh, I see. So the monitoring, is, you just are notified. You just get the note of the, the alarm. Right, so it doesn't have to go through, like, ADT and then they call us. So it eliminates that step. We're actually the monitoring service. So it actually, it's a cost-saving measure, too. They don't have to pay to have somebody else monitor all their alarms. Um, I'm projecting to close out my year with $48,000 left in my budget. So that's pretty good. Um, we, I attribute that that we get $94,000 for the support and incentive grant this past year from the state 911 department. Although we're, we're seeing a reimbursement to be a little bit cumbersome, I'm finally getting my FY12 reimbursements. Um, it's like they got backed up in some of the new state standards and all the additional stuff that they're requiring on the municipalities now. Um, so I use the majority of that for salaries. Um, I can use it for big ticket items. If I didn't have the money in my budget for my uninterrupted power supply, it was going to come out of that grant. Um, I'm hoping to put my radio upgrade in that grant next year, and if that if they um, deny that, then I'm going to use my fire alarm monitoring fund to pay for a radio upgrade. It costs about $28,000. Um, I have a training grant that I got um, almost $20,000 for, and that pays for my dispatchers to attend training. The um, cost to replace them at training. So if it's a day shift dispatcher, it pays their salary to go and someone to pay overtime to sit in the dispatch center to cover their shift. And it also pays for the fees for training. Um, I've not been able to use all that money just for availability of classes, um, but it's there if we need it. Um, this past year I held six classes. I did a communication training officer class, active shooter, customer service for telecommunicators, disaster operations, um, and then also our emergency fire dispatch, which now um, my staff is completely co compliant. Those are, um, I'm sure you've heard of the EMD, emergency medical dispatch. It's one of the state, the municipality pushes to get everyone certified in emergency medical dispatch. So it doesn't matter if you're in Boston, Asheville, Northampton, you're going to be asked the same set of questions um, and been able, be able to give instructions for CPR or, or childbirth or anything like that. Um, this is just the fire version of it, which is something we've used and we want our full staff to be certified in it. So we had that class and I had five dispatchers attend and get certified. Um, but it also opens up to other communities that might want to come in and take the classes. So uh, it's just kind of improving dispatching across the board. Next year I'm going to have some legal classes for the dispatchers to get them some more law background. Um, and my grant funding for next year should be about the same. I'm um, looking at around ninety-two to $94,000 for support and incentive and about $18,000 for training. Um, uh, so right now I have six trainers that um, all take advantage of the Fred Pryor's Me Rewards Membership Program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that company. They do a lot of office, develop, um, office staff and personnel development. I have the trainers all taking classes in customer service, how to train, um, effective communication for women, since all my staff is women. Um, conflict re resolution, and when they get back from the training, they actually have to provide me with a synopsis of what they've learned in class, how they're going to implement it and use it in the dispatch center, and also if it's applicable, if it's something that a subject that they can teach on, they're to develop a curriculum to teach it to the dispatchers based on that class. So it's kind of, you know, it's $200 investment per dispatcher, but they get unlimited training for a year, either online or in person, and then it goes back into my dispatch center. Um, What's the name of that? Fred. Fred Pryor, and it's also Career Track. Um, we, I continue to have monthly staff meetings with my dispatchers. It's always the first pay Thursday of the month. 
and it gives me an opportunity to go over anything that's been changing in um, the dispatch world, uh, any new policies we need to implement, be able to give dispatchers recognition for calls that they did really well. But it also, um, I provide uh, one to two hour training every staff meeting. So this month is going to be, uh, Firefighter Nazaro is going to come up and do a radio class for them. But the trainers now have been tasked with taking a curriculum, making it applicable to Northampton and teach the other dispatchers. So one of them is dealing with suicidal callers and the resources that we have available to us. Um, so we're re I'm really trying to build in a program where we kind of take care of our own and train in-house um, because now the state requires that we have at least 16 hours of continuing education every year. And our, um, for our certifications, they require at least 48 hours of continuing, continuing education every two years. So, which is good, I mean, to keep their, you know, we're not going to deal with structure fires every day, but if we can train on it, then we can handle it effectively. Um, I'm also currently exploring the options of having EAP come in and do some training, uh, more of a personnel development, or and personal development, um, you know, dealing with burnout and financial stress in this today's economy, just as a, an extra training for the dispatchers. Um, I, I called HR today about that. I'm not sure if there's a cost associated, but like I said, I'm just starting to explore that. Um, and then also we have several dispatchers uh, take part in the fire department trainings that they have. Vehicle education, tonight they're doing an MDU drill up at CDH that I encourage the dispatchers to go to, just to, uh, to, for them to get an idea of what happens on scene. Um, and then they've been doing police ride-alongs when we're up to full staffing, we have an extra dispatcher on, um, they can go on ride-alongs. Um, and then the last piece that I have is that as of June 10th, we're going to be starting to take over the fire department business lines. So if you call 587-1032, it normally will go to a cumbersome phone tree, and then you have to pick who to choose. All those calls are now going to get bumped to dispatch, so we actually will be able to um, resource out, okay, do you need smoke detector inspection? Let me transfer you to Captain Therian. Um, to eliminate that phone tray, to make more of a personal experience, and to make sure that people are reaching the individual that they really need to speak with. I mean, the fire chief has messages on his voicemail for an alarm sounding that went off last night, but it's okay, I don't think anything's on fire. He'll get it at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they never call us. So it's to kind of streamline that as well. And that, that came out of the city stat. Um, that the fire department's taking part in, and it, it will, should help to relieve some of the burden on Melissa Browse, the administrative assistant, to kind of filter through those calls. So, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, can I? No problem. Um, you, uh, the consolidation of East Hampton, mm -hmm. the difference was really because they're, they are a, uh, they're sworn officer dispatch, and you're a civilian dispatch, is that kind of what was one of the problems? No, no, they're civilian dispatchers, but they're in a station where there's police presence. We are the only or the only dispatch center in, in the state that actually is a fire in a fire department. So part of the LEAPS thing is that they want to have a police officer present, or they need to have a connection directly into a law enforcement agency. So we would have to, there's a whole process, they have to purchase another terminal. Um, so that was one of the concerns that came out of the study, is that they don't have a police officer in the building, so we wouldn't have that capability. So they also, I mean, they're the ones that are sitting behind the desk when you go into East Hampton Public Safety, so if we took them out of there, they'd have to have an officer come out the street and sit there and greet citizens. I don't have anything else, so. How does the budget look? Uh, right now, it looks like it was approved. I, I have a budget hearing on Tuesday. Um, like I said, I'm still going to get those grants. Um, we did have an increase in our budget because the dispatcher's salaries were, um, I think they did a pay adjustment for the dispatchers. Um, and then my lead dispatcher got a pay adjustment because um, there was a dispatcher that hired at the same time she was and they're only making three cents less an hour. And she was the supervisor. So. She had a pay adjustment, so I do account for that. Um, I'm still able to take in, I'm, I cover the computer costs for our tracking program, which is IMC, and the radio maintenance contract for both police and fire. I was still able to carry that as an expense item. But other than that, I don't have any increased expenses, and I normally have money left over at the end of the year because of the um, grants. The grants, the, the state grants, you usually spend a lot of them as much as you can. 
Yes, that's that's the first that's the first revenue source I try to get rid of is I'll I'll account most of my staffing right to that state grant. I try to burn that out as quickly as possible because like I said before, it's so cumbersome to get the reimbursements back. So if I can spend it by November or December and then everything else will come directly out of my regular budget. And is that I mean do you expect that the, especially that nine one one grant, is that, that the, what you call that the support grant? Yeah, the support and incentive grant. So is that I mean is that something the state's committed to, or is this something they just are doing just to get everybody up and running? We've, no, we've actually been getting it for the past, I want to say since 2007, I think is when they started that. It started halfway through the year in 2007. Um, and it's generally between eighty dollars and $90,000 for us. It's based on the 911 call volume. Um, and hopefully we don't see an end to that anytime soon. But it all, um, and then the training one comes from when you pay your cell phone bill, you'll see a 911 charge on there. That is the money. That's where that revenue source is from. So as long as people get more cell phones, they'll have more money at the state. Right, that's the training side. But then the, the other one, the state, the support incentive, that's just something that they've committed to. It's one of those that we're not sure every year if we're going to get it. And they'll put out the paperwork generally in April or May. Um, they just actually released the numbers now. but. That was something that they can't promise to. They don't, I don't know where they're getting that money from. But I mean, are there communities that, that aren't getting it? There are communities that are applying that aren't getting it? No, every, no, I'm sorry. Every municipality in Massachusetts has an option to apply for it. There's, it's not a um, competitive grant. As long as you have a 911 terminal in your center, you, you can get the grant. And they actually, the, I think the original intent is for people to consolidate. Because if you consolidate with more communities, you get more grant funding. I think that's what the support and incentive part of it is. Yes. So we tried it. Um, you know, the other thing with consolidation is um, it's really important to make sure geographically you choose a community um, and something that's going to be comparable to your center. So. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.